Um, this is very exciting to see such a large number of people here for the, the, the global mental health panel. I can say that um, having been in this field now for over a decade, um, the interest is growing and, and it's nice to see that we're at uh, more than capacity. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, the challenge, some of the challenges of doing mental health in different contexts, cross-culturally, uh, as well as in low and middle income settings, as well as some strategies that our research group has come up with that might be able to address some of these challenges. So what are some of the challenges related to doing mental health cross-culturally? Well, first of all, one of the issues is that there can be different belief systems about what causes mental health problems. And these different belief systems can range from the biological. Many of our health systems here in the US think that mental health is something that's going on in the brain. There's also the psychosocial or the, the sociological approach where there's interpersonal problems and interpersonal relations. But there's also the belief that things might be related to spirituality, either through religion, um, through, through voodoo, through experiences of, of um, a wide range of sort of of belief systems that might be quite different. And what's interesting to keep in mind is that most contexts and most cultures have a variety of these uh, belief systems that can sit together. So it's not, oftentimes people can say, yes, we know it's a physical health or we know it's a health problem. We understand that it's something that's going on in the body, but we also can think that it could be caused by things outside of the body, the spirit world. So these aren't necessarily, you don't say a culture fits into any one of these, but within the same person and within the same culture, these different ideological beliefs can sit together, which can make sometimes things a little bit more difficult. Another area that has sort of general variation across cultures is this issue of, of presentation. And one of the major areas of presentation that can vary is somatic symptoms, or where people feel their feelings. And so some people feel anxiety in their butterflies in their stomach. We hear that a lot here in the US. But someone else might feel anxiety or feelings of pain in a different part of the body, and understanding that that can vary across cultures. And finally, while the risk factors and stressors that can cause mental health distress and mental health problems, can, while, while the existence of those um, might not vary, the degree of those stresses can vary quite, quite a lot across contexts, particularly when you move into low and middle income contexts. Issues like exposure to war, violence, and poverty, particularly and, and illness like HIV, can just be at a, such a different degree that it has a different impact on mental health. So what are some of the challenges to doing standard research? Well, if you apply for NIH grants, you usually have to state what is your hypothesis. Well, there's been a war, we're going to go, and we think that there's going to probably be a lot of PTSD, so we're going to go do PTSD research. The way our system of research works is mostly researchers have to go in, or do go in, having an idea of what the problem is. And that doesn't allow us to say, well, Let's take a step back, and it doesn't, what, are, what is actually the problem that this population, or problems that the population is suffering from, and what are their health priorities? So there's often a conflict between the research approach and the local needs approach, and sometimes they match, and sometimes there is a mismatch. Another area that is um, not just unique to low and middle income countries, but to lots of cross-cultural contexts, is in the study of mental health, we lack a gold standard. Here in the West, what's often used as a gold standard is a diagnosis by a psychiatrist who's trained in Western medicine. And that's used to validate measures. Well, if you've got a different conception of mental health, or if you've got a same conception of mental health, but you use different terms and symptoms and phrases, then matching that to a clinician might, might not work. And also in many of these countries, if you look at the WHO atlas, you can go and see how many psychiatrists and, clinic and mental health professionals there are in each of the countries. You can see that in some countries you're talking like three psychiatrists in the whole country. So if you need to rely on a psychiatric evaluation, <coughs> even if it does match the local syndrome, that may not be something that's possible when you have so few mental health professionals. So again, these are the challenges that we face when doing mental health programs, mental health research cross-culturally.
so what does it mean to do a mental health study? If we want to do a mental health study, what, what is it that we want to hold on to? Well, what we want to hold on to is a syndrome. We want to identify a problem. And if we can identify a problem, then maybe we can identify solutions to treat that problem. If that problem looks like something we already recognize. If you find that depression exists, and we have treatment for depression, maybe we can adapt our treatments to be utilized to serve the population for that problem. So what is a mental health problem? What is a syndrome? So it's a problem of clustering of symptoms. It's a group of signs and symptoms, people's expression of distress, people's feelings, people's emotions and their thoughts that occur in a, in a specific period of time. So just feeling bad is not a mental health problem. It's not a mental health syndrome. It actually is a grouping of problems together. And so if we want to think about that cross-culturally, how do we identify what are symptoms, what are syndromes in different contexts? The second issue is, okay, let's say we identify something as a syndrome. Does the local population think of it as a problem? Do they consider it actually pathologic or do they see it as part of life? Do they see it as something that needs service or needs treatment? What is this local population's belief around causes and what it leads to? And understanding that helps us think about the appropriate services and how to get into services. What are other things that are associated with it? And where is, how does this affect the individual? So really thinking about, you know, if people have this problem, how does it affect their actual working and being in the community? So I wanted to talk a little bit and give some examples about the way that our research team, the Applied Mental Health Research Group is, was introduced, has started to approach trying to get at some of these issues. And again, this is one approach um, and, and one that we've been working with for a while. So we start all our projects with some qualitative research. And the idea here is to try and understand from the local population, wherever you're working, what it means to have a mental health problem. What is the mental health problems that are relevant? Uh, what, is the ways, what are the ways that people describe the problems they're suffering from? And, and how do they conceptualize it? And this preliminary information allows us to inform interventions, but also allows us to inform our measurement. So we start with some very simple methods, some free listing, which are general questions where we put out a big general question and we ask people to give us all different responses and I'll give you an example of that. And then we mo go into more in-depth interviews, some key informant interviews where we spend some time with people who are knowledgeable about the problems identified going more in depth. And in full, we can usually run this if we have the resources in about two to three weeks. And this is a good starting place for understanding what problems are important locally. So I'll give you an example. We wanted to understand, and we were working with a hospital in the capital of Congo, um, in King, uh, Kingasani, which is one of the poorest areas in the capital city of Kinshasa. And the maternity hospital said, you know, we have these women who come in, they give birth, and then they don't come back. And we know that there's some problems that they're having, but we don't know what to deal with it. We don't know what to call it. We see some of the distress, and, and we don't know what to do. So our goal was to understand the mental health problems of mothers in the postpartum period. So you can see I didn't say our goal being to understand depression, because I didn't want to assume that what we were looking at was depression. So our whole sample was about 80 women with babies in the one to two age range. So we started with our free list questions. What are the main problems of women who have babies less than one year of age? And our second question was, what are the main problems that women have that affect their babies? And so here again, we didn't say mental health. We didn't assume that their conception of mental health would be our conception of mental health. We didn't even say health. We started, what are the problems? So not surprisingly, the first number, the first thing that they talked about was poverty. Poverty, lack of jobs, lack of education. That's not going away in these contexts. And, and some of the work I'm doing right now is looking at the co-occurrence of mental health problems in the context of poverty and how we can um, impact both. But, but that is one of their primary concerns and it will always show up. But as we asked on, what else, what other types of problems do women have? They started to talk about some other problems that were related more to what we think of as mental health. And in the first question, what are the problems of mothers? They told us about this, prob this triad of problems, this triad of symptoms, worry, torment of the mind, and lack of peace. It was about halfway down the list. But when we asked the second question, what are the problems that mothers have that affect their children? It jumped up. 
So there was this recognition among the women that yes, this was something that women had, but they also recognized this was something that was not good for their children, not only for themselves, but also impacted their children. So this was our hook. This was this recognition, this priority setting from the local population of what they were telling us was important. So from this, from this we moved into our key informant interviews where we asked more about these three symptoms. And in the end, we came up with a syndrome of sorts that could be described by many of the key informants and we could bring it to the, to the hospital and ask, this, ask the um, nurses to, to talk about this problem, Maladi Yasusi, which is basically a French uh, Lingala combination of words, but a, a syndrome of worry. They didn't call it depression, but if you look at it, it's pretty classical depression. Now, whether it's depression specific to postpartum or depression that may exist regularly and women have it during this period, we don't know. And to be honest, we weren't really worried about trying to get specific, a description of depression re only related to postpartum. We were interested in finding out the problems of these women more generally. But what you can see is through this bottom-up approach, we identified something that was pretty clearly what we would consider depression. There were some variations, but the core symptoms were not un unknown to us. So then we took the step back and said, okay, let's take some measures. Let's see how we can validate and develop measures. So we used two standard measures, the Hopkins Symptom Checklist for Depression and Anxiety and the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale. We used the local terminology to translate, adapt. So when there were questions in those questionnaires that were exactly what were part of the qualitative, we just took the language and put it in. Where there were questions that weren't part of the qualitative, we then did some translation back, translation group translation. And then we also added items that were relevant from the qualitative to the questionnaires to make sure we were capturing what was important locally. So then we have to say, okay, well, how are we gonna validate this? And as I said at the very beginning, we have this problem where we don't have a gold standard. How do we validate it when you don't have something that looks like a DSM or when you don't have a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist or someone who's a mental health professional to diagnose people? So we came up with an alternative to the gold standard approach. And so we, step one, we determined our local equivalence of depression. We had our syndrome and a name. And we asked our key informants, we asked the people who had told us about the problem, who in your community has come to you with this problem? Who are the women who currently suffer from it? And who are the women who don't? And we created this, this alternative to a clinical identification. We asked the women who people actually go to for help to help us identify women with the syndrome in their mind and women without. We then asked the women themselves who are identified, do you self-identify as having this problem? And basically what we are trying to do is to create probable cases. We're never gonna be able to say, yes, this is the absolute case, but probable cases and probable non-cases of people with this syndrome. And compare, did our measurement tool actually differentiate between these two groups? So as I said, for our validation study, we created these two groups. We compared them, and then we also wanted to compare to see to what degree people with mental health problems or this mental health problem also had accompanying dysfunction. So a convergent validity. Are the things that we think go wrong along with mental health problems like functional impairment related? Are they going in the direction that we would hypothesize? And our sample, our results show that basically yes. Our sample was 41 women who self-identified as having this syndrome of depression as well as having the key informant identify them as having it, as well as 20 sort of con convergence on the non-cases. And if you see our depression scale, the difference in, in average scores was quite significant. So we thought our measurement tool was capturing people with a lot of symptoms and being able to differentiate between people with few symptoms. And as you'll note, the people with few symptoms, they don't have no symptoms. Having symptoms is not a disorder and it's normal, particularly in the postpartum period, you're gonna have up and down days. So we never expected the non-cases to be at zero and that would make our question about our measurement. If we actually had a zero, that, that would be odd. We also looked at it comparing our function scale. So people we expected, hypothesize, that if our function scale was capturing this problem, women who had the, pro who had the disorder, who had this syndrome, would have higher dysfunction and we see that as well. And then we were also basically, because we use standard measures to generate a modified what we'd call DSM-IV disorder,
based on the symptom presentation. And again, we found good, good uh, discrimination. And basically, this tells us now we have a tool that can capture something, and that, cap that something we're trying to capture looks like depression. So next steps would be saying, OK, let's screen women in and develop an intervention. I want to give another example where we did not necessarily find something that fit exactly the standard measures that we have. And so we had to take a different approach rather than adapting existing measures. So we worked in northern Uganda with adolescents. This was in the time when the Lord's Resistance Army was actually working more, was actually more regularly in that region and hadn't moved on. Um, and we worked in two of the internally displaced persons camps. Again, we started with our qualitative study. This, because we were working with adolescents, we talked to adolescents, we also talked to caregivers. We asked some of the same free list questions. What are the problems of adolescents living in the camp? Um, what are their activities and tasks to generate the uh, function measure? Again, we, talked to we did key informant interviews with adolescents as well, as well as with teachers and other caregivers and people who were knowledgeable about the youth. And what we found was rather than a, a clean syndrome of PTSD, given that we were working in, in an IDP camp in a war-torn area, the assumption was that we were going to find PTSD. And this is not to say we didn't find symptoms of trauma, but the predominant symptoms we found were of these local syndromes, which if you look at them closely, are syndromes of distress. They're symptoms of, inter of adolescent internalizing problems, depression, anxiety, behavior problems, not unlike what we might see in some of our inner city adolescent populations here in the US. So these were, again, rather than going in and assuming war-torn area, let's do PTSD interventions, we found that what was predominantly in their mind at the time of our study was more problems around adolescence and adolescence distress. And so we developed interventions for this. So briefly to go over the validity study, because we didn't have a questionnaire that was already in existence to test. We created a measurement tool. Um, we call it the Acholi uh, Psychosocial Assessment Instrument. Um, and it captures all of those measures that, all of those symptoms that I just showed you. And, oh, let me, oh, let me go back for a second. Previous. And here, rather than using a key informant, because we had a different scenario, we used the self and the caregiver to identify that, tr that, that, that identification of probable cases. So every situation is going to have us rely on different scenarios for trying to identify different types of, of probable cases. And just to give the results, again, we found our, if you, the presence and the absence of the different syndromes, our measure was able to quite well discriminate between kids who are identified as having these problems versus not. And then we did some areas under the curve. And again, using other statistical techniques, we were able to show that we had a measure that could accurately identify kids. And it's important because if we want to screen people into programs and we want to monitor and evaluate those programs, we need measurement tools that we can feel confident about. So what's next? The next is to say that none of these methods are perfect and we're still developing them, whether it's getting better at our measurement of functionality in, among adolescents and children, um, trying to come up with better ways of identification of sort of our probable cases, um, and, and talking about the importance of needs assessments and how we can't just go in with our assumptions about what the problems will be. And finally, that if you, that, that Given that you can do these methods and that they can come out and give you better information about assessment, there's really no reason <laughs> folks should be using non-validated measures. People should at least test to make sure that they're measuring. So when you read journal articles, go see. Take a look. See if they say we had translated it or we translated it and evaluated it. See if you're getting a measure that's actually that you feel confident that, they're, that they spent the time that they're measuring what they think they're measuring. So with that, I want to put some acknowledgments. Um, all of this work is, is done in, co in a collaboration. We work in many different countries and many different sites with several different faculty all around the world. Uh, and the work is funded by lots of, again, lots of different agencies to get us to be able to talk about our program and our methods in general. So those are some of the folks that we have worked with over the years and some of our funders. Um, and uh, I don't know, will slides be made available? How does that work? 
I'm not sure, sir. I'm not sure, but um, there are a variety of also journal articles and, and citations. I don't know if you can actually read it, but um, there are papers out there that describe some of these methods more in detail and give some examples, specifically about the examples I gave as well as others. All right. Thank you.